I'm Jason Lewis. And I'm Todd Deshida. And I'm Thomas Mills. Welcome to Climate Optimus. As a couple concerned citizens, we're on a journey to explore climate solutions and ways each of us can make a difference. Well, as many of you know, here at Climate Optimus, we rely on listener donations to bring you the programming you hear. So if you're a regular listener and value what you get from us, consider a donation that aligns with that value. All you have to do is go to our website, climateoptimus.co, that's .co, and click the donate button. And as Todd says, no donation is too small or too big. Yes, no donation is too big. And while you're on our website, take a moment to sign up for our monthly newsletter. It offers facts on climate solutions, perspective on climate news, and tips on how to make a difference. Our January edition is set to hit mailboxes in the coming week, so check it out. Our heads will roll. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks thanks for the endorsement, Todd. You bet. So in our, our second podcast of this new year, we're focusing on climate through a slightly different lens than we normally do. Many of us appreciate the beauty, adventure, and serenity that the outdoors provides. I know I do. And for those of us who spend a lot of time outside, it's easy to see, you know, the changes that are unfolding around us as as the planet warms. And witnessing those changes and being able to speak to them makes us, you know, really powerful messengers in advocating for climate action. So today, We're lucky enough to have a guest from the American Alpine Club who works kind of at the the crossroads of outdoor adventure and climate policy. He's going to talk with us about the work his organization is doing, why climate advocacy matters, and, you know, how each of us can get involved. Before we go there, Thomas, you take us through this week's uh, Reason for Hope. Yeah, sure, Jason. So at the start of this year, uh, the U.S. government has kicked off its uh, tax incentives for commercial vehicles. So that means the average FedEx or Amazon delivery van that you see around your neighborhood now qualifies for a $7,500 tax credit if it's electric. And then for vehicles over 14,000 pounds, like semi-trucks and commercial buses, they'll qualify for a $40,000 credit. So this is a great thing because hopefully it sort of helps with that tipping point in getting businesses to dump the pump and make the switch. But um, uh, <laughs> my only concern with this though is like, it's it's not a graduated incentive. It just seems to be, hey, you know, when it's 14,000 pounds or more, um, you get a $40,000 credit. So let's hope we don't see a whole bunch of uh, FedEx delivery vans getting around with lead weights strapped underneath them or something like that. It seems a bit odd. But anyway, it's good news that there's finally something out there for commercial businesses to help them move in the right direction. Agreed. You know, Todd, I was thinking this might be finally that chance for you to buy a full-on tour bus for the the band. I'm going to go electric Kool-Aid acid test with this bad boy redo, right? (laughs) Do the second version. You know, our fleet at City of Portland, they they take advantage of a lot of this. They're really making efforts to go to go green and go electric with a lot of the fleet. Yeah, and I, I think in a in a city too, especially like Portland, where the air can be quite stagnant for quite a while, as we've maybe spoken about before. You know, you, you you question the uh, effectiveness of some of the diesel particulate filters and so forth that are put on these diesel trucks. So it's it's going to be great to see them gone entirely. Frankly. Yeah, and and you know, for those who don't know, I mean, transportation is now the largest source of emissions in the United States and it's a very close second in in Europe. So, you know, making our switch to electric transportation is going to be essential, you know, if we're going to hit those 2030 climate targets that we need to. Yeah, and somebody was asking me just the other day, "Oh, you know, what what are you going to do about all these diesel trucks, you know, you won't have the the battery range?" But as Tesla's shown, you you can do this, right? They've got 18-wheeler semis that are, are running 500 miles between charges, which is more than adequate for, I would say, 99% of the situations. Yeah, definitely. So pivoting to our main topic, our guest today is Taylor Leno. Taylor is the policy director for the American Alpine Club, where he works to protect treasured public lands engage recreationists in action on climate change, and increase equitable access to the outdoors. In his work, Taylor uses the power of law and science to advocate for sound environmental and recreation policy 
through an equity lens. He holds a master's in environmental law and policy from Vermont Law School and a master's of science in natural resources from the University of Vermont. Taylor enjoys exploring the San Juan Mountains on a split board or crampons and rock climbing in the desert southwest near his current home of Durango, Colorado. He's a current board member of Friends of Indian Creek and the Durango Climbers Coalition and an apprentice rock, ice, and alpine guide. And as a uh, climber myself, super excited to have him on the program. Taylor, welcome to Climate Optimists. Hey, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So to start you off, uh, when you think about efforts to address climate change, what makes you hopeful? Well, I'll I'll say this, that advocating for climate action can be kind of discouraging at times. Like, you know, there's gr- a lot of grief and fear and injustice that's woven into the reality of the changing climate. Um, and I try not to like apply too much toxic positivity to the, the reality of the situation, but I actually am really positive about it. And, and there's a bunch of reasons why. Just a couple that came to mind that I was thinking about this morning was, uh, I'll give you five. <laughs> I'll give you five reasons why I'm optimistic. Uh, first off, the cost of renewables and uh, energy storage has like, dropped substantially. I remember having conversations as a, as a child with my parents about solar and like the conversation always coming back to battery storage. And just like basically it was a non-starter for them. And so the fact that now um, like photovoltaics are like way more affordable that you can outfit yeah. most family homes, like that's really cool. I would also say that public opinion for, on climate change is largely on our side. I think it's three quarters of Americans believe that global warming is happening now and that we should regulate CO2 as a pollutant. So that's like really optimistic. Like that means that we've got some like actual public demand behind policy changes that need to be happening. At the youth movement, like I got to meet Greta Thunberg when I was in um, DC, not this past trip, but last year. And just like seeing how revved up the, you know, the youth are about this issue and like clearly not backing down. So it makes me really hopeful for the next generation of advocates that are coming up. The, the other th- the other two are like towns and cities and states are doing a ton of work on climate, even though the federal government has been kind of slow to move the big ship in the right direction. But like here in Colorado, our governor passed a bill this past year that created this climate action plan, which essentially puts us on this decarbonization train to wind down emissions by 26% by 2025, and then essentially by like 90% by 2050. And we have a similar plan here in my hometown in Durango. So it's really cool the work that local communities and states are actually doing on this issue. Like there is work that's actually getting done to address climate at the local level, especially. And then finally, I said all that about the local level, but the one big thing that happened this year on climate at the federal level is the Inflation Reduction Act. And I know you've had folks on the podcast talk about it before, but $369 billion with a B dollars is a lot of money for clean energy. Well, I think I think five's a lot of good reasons. Um, I, I'm with you that, you know, there is a delicate balance to walk. We don't want to, you know, be uh, glossing over the seriousness of what we're looking at, but momentum is in is, is definitely in the right direction, you know, given the stuff you're talking about right now. Yeah. And the thing that I love about the way that this podcast is framed is like, it does a really good job at focusing on solutions and not focusing on what has been kind of like the standard operating playbook of climate action from the past, which is like leveraging fear to motivate, to motivate folks to do the, the thing they want people to do. So what, what you're doing here by like focusing on solutions is actually the appropriate way to address the issue. It's not just being like, well, we're losing all of our towns to wildfire and isn't that suck? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, th- thanks for the vote of confidence in, yeah. in what we do. We, we appreciate it. So let's talk a little bit about you before we get into uh, kind of what you're doing and, and the work that your organization is doing. So to start out for folks who, who may not be familiar, um, who is the American Alpine Club and, you know, what's your role within the organization? Yeah. So the American Alpine Club is uh, the country's oldest climbing organization. It's 120 years old. It's founded in 1902, largely um, to support the exploration and research of high mountainous areas uh, around the world, really. 
but we do a whole bunch of things. So, you know, over that period of time, the organization has evolved a bunch. We have a, a whole host of different programs. Mine, I, I run our policy and advocacy department. So I'm the policy director at the AAC. And we work uh, largely on, on federal land management issues. Uh, we do a whole bunch of different government affairs stuff, largely related to land conservation and climate action, uh, access to the outdoors. But we also have a whole branch of volunteers all over the country that host all sorts of different education programming where they bring new climbers and introduce them to the outdoors and provide like safe skill sets for them to actually learn how to climb in new terrain. Uh, we host a series of climbing festivals all over the country. Uh, you're in Oregon, so I think the closest to you is Smith Rock. We host one out there every yeah. year. We also have a host of grants for research, for stewardship, uh, for adventure. Uh, so we fund people when they want to go to the Himalaya or you know, Alaska or in, even in their backyard to just like go pursue their climbing and skiing goals. And we we also are you know we're a storytelling organization as well. We you know we we publish a series of books, uh, including the American Alpine Journal and the Accidents in North American Climbing. So we do a whole host of things. But my department, my oversight is focused on our policy and advocacy work. So quite a bit of breadth when it comes to to climbing. And, you know, obviously you're covering everything from climbing mountains to climbing rock to climbing ice. So maybe, you know, from there, let's let's kind of pivot to what is the AAC specifically doing to help climate change? And, you know, maybe there's an obvious why, but I think it'd be good for folks to understand, you know, why you guys have gotten involved. Sure. Well, uh, so I've been with the club uh, coming up on five years now uh, in this role. And when I first showed up at the organization in 20, tail end of 2018, beginning of 2019, I recognized that our organization had never formally acknowledged that climate change was a thing, even though it's clearly having impacts on our community all over the country and all over the world. So we wanted to shift that and, you know, come out as an organization and actually address it head on. And we sat down and uh, wrote a policy position statement that basically outlined our, you know, our commitment to this, you know, and the reasons why. And largely it's because of the, the effects that it's having on mountain environments and the places we go recreate, but also the communities and places that we love. And, uh, and that, that's a serious issue. And we were committed to, to addressing that. So, you know, after we got basically the words down on paper, you know, then what? So what right. we, you know, like, okay, that's cool. You like publish those. Now the work starts. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, basically like, okay, this is a thing. And that, that even wasn't easy. We were concerned because our membership, it's a huge, you know, we, we represent over 25,000 members across the country. And so we were worried at the time, at least our, our leadership was, you know, this being like a highly political issue. Like if we come out and say this, are we going to lose a bunch of members and donors? It's probably something that a lot of other organizations have had a conversation internally, like, ooh, we don't want to touch that. So like, we're just going to focus on this other thing, even though it's important to our community. Like, I don't mean to shy away from it. But thankfully, like we had an executive team that was willing to lean into it. And we worked with uh, the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication that has done so much research on the American public, how they relate to the issue of climate change. And so we we worked with Yale to survey our community, and we came out of that realizing that climbers, on average, are far more alarmed than the general American public about climate change. And we were like, whoa. Uh, and one of the things that we included in that survey, just as like a, a tail end question, was like, you know, have you you know have you actually seen places where, you know, you believe that climate is impacting the places you go climb and ski? You know, include story here. And I was like, we'll see if anybody actually takes the time to write back. And we, we collected over 1,600 individual stories from folks around, around the country uh, wow. saying, oh, I used, to, I used to go ski in this place, but now you know, it doesn't snow as frequently. Or uh, we used to go climb in this particular location, but the glacier has receded so much that we're unable to access it anymore. Or it just like, it was so, so confirming for me that this was an issue that we really needed to, to step up on and had, you know, had lost years of potential work that we could have been doing on this, but that's hindsight. So we recognize that the community wants this. It's one of the top three reasons that the AAC membership supports our work and one of the top things that they want us working on. So since we got that, We've we've started to do a whole host of things. I think the first thing uh, was with our task force, we launched a multi-year 
research project. And primarily what that project seeked to accomplish was to figure out what the direct impact of climate change was on winter climbing. So basically, I'm an ice climber. I grew up in Vermont. And <laughs> selfishly, I was like, well, what does that mean for ice climbing You know, across the country? Right. And I mean, it's a, probably an obvious answer. Warmer temperatures mean no ice. <laughs> Things are going to melt. Right. It's going to be wet. But we needed to quantify that because there's a lot of other questions around that, like how much smaller does the ice climbing or winter climbing season become? And then importantly, what does that mean for local communities? Like how do, how do mountain guides adapt and respond to this knowledge? And so that research, it's currently being peer reviewed. We're really excited about it. And one of the big takeaways from that was that, you know, under a higher carbon emission scenario, basically, uh, you know, like if we were to continue on the trajectory that we're on, temperatures would increase to such a degree that the climbing season in Mount Washington Valley, which is the case study that we chose for this project, we scaled to just the Mount Washington Valley in New Hampshire, that the winter season there would shrink from what is currently about 100 days in the winter season to about 30 or less. So you go from several months, yeah, several months to less than a month or about a month of a, a potential ice climbing season. So these are like really interesting things that we're bubbling to the top and I'm looking forward to sharing that research and we're going to be uh, doing a presentation at the Matt Washington Ice Festival. I'm hoping that we'll have a little film there. We're going to have a panel discussion on this work. Um, so that'll be kind of like the world premiere. So if you're if you're uh, in New England listening to this, February 3rd to the 5th, I think, is when that ice festival is. And yeah, we're going to be premiering that there. I'll stop there. Can I keep talking about things that we do? <laughs> <laughs> so it's heartening to hear that, you know, you guys took a look in the mirror, it sounds like, decided that this was something that was valuable and had the courage to sort of jump in. And I guess that makes me think about kind of like what, you know, might other outdoor organizations who, you know, have or are impacted by climate change, you know, what might their role, you know, be in terms of helping, you know, move progress forward on the issue? Hmm. Well, I mean, if, if there's an organization out there that's concerned about the political landscape of taking action on this. I mean, you can you can adapt from our model, which was to collect data and, you know, to build confidence before j- jumping in. But fr- frankly, I, I feel like it's it's an issue that folks just need to be, in court, especially if you're a nonprofit that's working in the environmental or conservation space, it just needs to be a part of your portfolio, like full stop, period. If you're a conservation organization, say a land trust, and you're worried about the long-term stewardship of the properties that you hold, climate is definitely going to impact the conservation values of those places. So you need to be figuring out an adaptation strategy for that. If you're an environmental justice organization, you're trying to figure out how to impact BIPOC communities, low to moderate income communities, folks that are in foreign places that are are under-resourced. Climate is a very clear impact on those communities. And these are things that have to be at the front of your staff's mind. Um, And I would assume that for the most part, they probably are. So yeah, I think data is helpful. Uh, Talking with your community is helpful. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, having the leadership and the guts to be able to step out there and say, like, this is impacting the community for which we serve, and we are going to take action on it. Like, that's what's needed at all organizations across, you know, across the country that are working or interested or playing around with the idea of this. So so as we're talking about, you know, all the work you guys are doing, I think many listeners know political advocacy is something that's that's uh, near and dear to me. Wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, from your perspective, why it's important for folks, if they are concerned about this issue, to try to get engaged where they can. You know, it's a it's a thing that has come up a lot in the outdoor industry. Because I think at first, when these conversations got started, the common, you know, the common talking point from like coal and oil and gas lobbyists would be like, well, you are asking for action on climate change, but you still drive a car and you still buy all those uh, Gore-Tex shells and all those new skis. And so what would what would end up happening is they would turn the argument on its head and be like, well, basically calling people hypocrites for, for, for continuing to live their lifestyle. It's as though like we needed to be like 
you know, hunter gatherers living outside, uh, with, or, or, you know, at, even at home, just like eating cold, cold salads with the lights turned off and the heat, heat turned off. <laughs> but, <laughs> so like for a while it, it took them, you know, it took, it took some internal reflection for people to think about, okay, like, can I just address the problem by changing my personal behavior? And unfortunately, like if you were to look at, if you were to look at the carbon footprint of myself and like how much carbon I could draw down, even if we were to do that collectively as a, as a nation, if we were to just to change all of our personal behaviors, that's not really going to take a big chunk out of our carbon emissions as a country or certainly not by as a globe. So yes, we can all start with personal behavior change, but advocacy at a political level is so important for climate, which is this huge lurking challenge. Um, and it's going to take a it's going to take political will to actually like address something that's that big, that's so interwoven into our economy uh, and to the political systems that already exist. So one example that uh, the Alpine Club took on as like a systems issue was in 2020 when uh, the Trump administration pulled apart the regulations that implement the National Environmental Policy Act. You know, they started to pull things out of that, which were put in place to basically protect the environment. You know, one of those things that was a part of the regulation was this thing called the cumulative and indirect effects analysis. Basically, what it is, is it's whenever, uh, you know, the Bureau of Land Management, for instance, is going to do an oil and gas lease sale. One of the things that they need to account for in their uh, environmental impact statement is uh, what the impact will be uh, you know, cumulatively over a long period of time. And essentially, that's kind of code for climate change. And in multiple cases, when agencies haven't stopped to look at what that impact is, whether it's like a new energy power plant or uh, you know a, a highway, it's been litigated and they've lost. <laughs> and so, in 2020, that 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 particular analysis, along with a bunch of other things, got pulled out. So agencies were no longer required to stop and think about climate change whenever they did a big project. This is all agencies across the country. So that's a systems issue. That's a systems issue that requires advocacy because if you were just to change your personal behavior, like that's not going to change this huge environmental regulation. So the Alpine Club, along with a bunch of partners, got involved. We filed a lawsuit. Uh, we're currently in the middle of that, but you know we're represented by Earth Justice and the Western Environmental Law Center. And the cool thing about that is when the Trump administration left and the Biden administration came in, the new Council on Environmental Quality, which is the agency that writes those rules, they sat down with our group of folks and they said, okay, what's, what's the problem here? Like, how can we fix this with you? Like, we understand you're upset. And so we laid out our agenda and they're like, okay, we're going to work with you to address this in two phases. And the first phase, we're going to address the most important issues. One of those is the cumulative effects analysis. We're going to work with you to put that back in. And that was successfully done this past year. Uh, and we're working through the second phase here soon. So that's a thing that like, it's so buried, it's buried down there in like the bottom of the policy like world. And you're like, you know, that's has a huge impact. Like the USGS did this analysis a bunch of years ago that found that 25% of our nation's carbon emissions comes directly from our public lands, 25%. That's crazy. <laughs> so, yeah. And it's largely from oil and gas development. And so if you stop and think about how we actually manage our public lands and you have the rule, the rule book in place to make sure that our land managers are actually thinking about climate change before they make decisions, well, you know, then you actually have a chance of like chipping away at this, you know, a quarter of our, car our carbon emissions. Like that's a huge right. opportunity that exists in this very narrow world. Um, and it requires advocacy from people. Otherwise, like, you know, people get away with that kind of stuff. So, well, I think... I mean, clearly a great example of, you know, the value that advocacy can have. And, and it sounds like, you know, the American Alpine Club and, and a number of other organizations, had you guys not gotten involved, we might not be talking about the fact that now that, you know, that language is being put back into that rule. So, you know, it seems like a certainly a victory, which is great, um, mm -hmm. but also an example of the sort of the outsized impact that you can have if you, you know, are able to shape policy. I guess I'm wondering for, for folks who, you know, whether climbers or, you know, others in the outdoor space um, and are wanting to get involved, care about climate change, what would be sort of your advice to them? 
I'm going to give you a generic answer. I know it. <laughs> I, like the thing that I, I found to be most useful is you get super educated on it. Okay. Like climate is inherently a scientific issue. You know, some scientists are willing to stick their neck out and be like, this is what my data show. And it's a huge problem because of X, Y, Z, and we need to do something. Other scientists they, they don't want to mix personal opinion and research together. And so they just present the facts. And so it's up to us as the public to basically interpret that and figure out how to apply the, the data. And so if you can become data literate, I would say that's first and foremost, understand what the science says, do the research, figure it out. Secondly, talk, talk about it, talk about it, like share your stories, like the, the example I gave before, the fact that we collected 1,600 individual stories from climbers and skiers across the country sharing about how they have seen climate impacts, I mean, that's really unique. And then sharing those stories with other people has created this culture where, you know, two-thirds of the American public want the government to do more on climate change. Um, now, we access the conversation through a very privileged lens, and I think it's important for me to acknowledge that. We, we talk about how a changing climate impacts the thing that we do to play, you know, but sure. in, in reality, I think for a lot of us in the outdoor recreation space, it, you know, we use our activity as an entrance into this conversation. It gets people connected to the issue. And then, it, and then, you know, and then we get to talk about some of the more like heavy things like food scarcity, water insecurity, climate-driven migration, you know, wars that will happen over resource scarcity, you know, but we, we enter the conversation by looking at what is close to us. And so we talk about recreation and the impacts of climate on it, but there are all of these co-benefits to other communities around us. And then there's plenty of options out there to like engage in advocacy. You don't have to go to law school to get engaged in this. Like you can sit down and write your, your lawmaker a letter. I found out recently, I forget what exactly what the stat is, but I think that if you tag your legislator in seven tweets, the the chance of that office actually responding to the you directly or the issue increases by like 50 fold. So actually oh, wow. like the slacktivism thing actually does work. If you're if you're persistent and you're writing your congressperson or you're showing up for town halls and you're raising these issues, like that's all really important. And one of the things I guess finally like the Alpine Club launched this thing this past year called the Climbers Advocacy Network because uh, we've had volunteers kind of all over the country, uh, 70 sections and chapters scattered around different states and uh, across the country for, for years. And many of those folks have been doing advocacy work on our behalf uh, somewhat informally. And we wanted to create a formal track for them and to provide them the resources necessary to actually do advocacy with all the tools that you could possibly want. And so we created this program and, you know, a lot of the work that you can do is, is within your local communities. You can write your county commissioner a letter, like those people are very accessible. Uh, and that's something that you can do at the, the local level and have a really outsized impact very quickly. I'm sure people have heard that before, but it's my take on it. I, I think that makes sense though. I mean, it sounds like, you know, for to sum it up, like, you know, get littered on the issue don't be afraid to to jump in, even if you you know don't have a, a background in natural resources or environmental law. That it, that it doesn't need that. And then it and then it sounds like you know start locally because uh, you know folks are as you say more accessible at the local level. And uh, there really can't be enough said about showing up to vote. I mean, to give you an example, so I live in Colorado's third district, and my my Congress. Uh, woman is uh, Congressman uh, Congresswoman Bobert, Lauren Bobert, who's based up in in Rifle. And if you know anything about her, climate is really not the top initiative for her. And <laughs> and uh, and to give you an example, so uh, the person who was running against her is Adam Frisch, who's uh, I think from Aspen, and uh, you know much more amenable to uh, climate policy and conservation initiatives, I think. But we sat glued to the polling results that it, and it, like basically they were within a couple hundred uh, votes of one another throughout the entire thing. I mean, I think the final tally was that Bobert won by, I think, like a thousand votes. And historically, the midterm election has only had about a 40 percent turnout. So, so if, if a 
you know, if everyone had shown up and actually voted, I mean, things could have gotten entirely different. Voting is like, again, so, so freaking important. It needs to just be like at the front of the mind of every climate activist because the margins can be really slim and your vote actually does really matter. Yeah, that's extremely tight margins and, you know, not always going to be the case, but I think your point of, you know, turnout really matters. And and I think if, if people that care about the issue turn out naturally, it becomes a, a higher priority. Well, Taylor, I think uh, we covered a lot of ground and certainly I think you laid out a pretty compelling case for people who are concerned about climate change and haven't yet to kind of take that plunge and, and get involved and you know, it sounds like there's plenty of opportunities to, to do that if you're a climber through the AAC. But uh, yeah, just want to say thanks for coming on and talking about, you know, the outdoor community, the, the role we have in helping, you know, push for climate legislation and, and, you know, sharing some good news with us. It was nice chatting with you. So gentlemen, what did you think of the interview with, with Taylor? Well, I thought one interesting piece of it was that, you know, the, their organization is kind of centered around, I guess you could call it a hobby, but maybe for some people it's a, a career. Um, they're in a unique position where they're in places that people just usually aren't in. You know, I'm not just going to go up one day and be strolling up onto, you know, a glacier <laughs> or whatever <laughs> in the mountainous terrain in this area, right? So they kind of get to see firsthand you know, some of the effects of, of climate change that, that other people just aren't going to see. And I think it's also cool that, you know, their organization has taken an interest in this, even though they're not necessarily a climate activist organization, but for them to get interested in things like when Trump removed the cumulative effects analysis, and most people don't know stuff like that is happening. And so when an organization like theirs can kind of direct their, their base to get behind an effort like that. I think that's really cool. I also don't spend time on glaciers, but I know a lot of people who do. And I'm with you that, you know, people who are in these remote outdoor environments and, you know, in reality, it doesn't even necessarily have to be remote, but spending time in these places, especially coming back to them again and again, it really does create this, you know, stark contrast, right? And, you know, helps, helps you real time, you know, see what changes are going on. Yeah, you know, and I, I looked up a little information on, on kind of the recession of, of glaciers and, and uh, Scientific American said, you know, that glaciers in Western North America, not including Alaska, have lost about 117 billion tons of ice since 2000, and they're losing about 12 billion tons a year. So, you know, these, these folks are kind of witnessing some of this stuff firsthand. Thomas, any thoughts from your end? Yeah, look, I, I think I'm... I'm g- glad that the uh, mindset amongst some of the outdoor types has started to change. It was, there was always sort of that, um, that mix of the really environmentalist crowd and then you know, what we used to call the clear cuts, the, the downhill ski crowd that were you know, all about the big pickup trucks, the, the resorts that were sponsored by the likes of Jeep or Toyota, the Warren Miller films that used to be sponsored by 4x4 companies and so forth. So the fact that those guys are now pivoting to accepting that this is an issue and something that we need to deal with is fantastic. But I think the other thing we need to keep in mind is like it goes a lot further than just glacial melt or the snow line rising or whatever it might be that affects you from a high alpine perspective because we have all these other issues such as wildfires that are going to cause problems for those that maybe aren't interested in you know, climbing glaciers or ice or you know, backcountry skiing. Um, I think of like the, the North Umpqua Trail in Southern Oregon, which we used to ride reliably every single year. And then you know, after a few very dry seasons, next thing is the whole thing gets burnt out. Then heavy rains, trails wash away, huge damage, et cetera. And you know, it's really important that everybody realizes that no matter what you're doing in the outdoors, climate change is going to affect you in one way or another. So we all need to get behind voting in the right direction and asking our representatives to make the right decisions with regard to the environment. Well, and I don't know, I, I think the outdoors is one of those few places where there's the potential to kind of bridge some of the polarization that we've had around climate. Yeah, the other thing I think is that 
Taylor brought up a good point about having anecdotal and relatable stories. Although like from a scientific context, it's not a great way of looking at things, but these are people that we've got to change. Um, and often it's, it's those anecdotal, anecdotal cases of what you've observed or experienced in your time in the outdoors and this change that you can tie down into a, you know, 30 second elevator pitch that helps influence other people that they need to be thinking or voting in a different direction. Yeah. I think those, the power of stories is something that often gets lost when we're talking about climate change. I mean, here I, you know, admittedly am the kind of person who would like to have facts, you know, stand on their own. But when you talk about getting people to, you know, be able to see a different perspective, it's it's often not the facts and figures that does it, right? It it is those stories that, you know, help bring people around, especially if if they have a similar story that that they can, you know, relate to. Yeah. I, I think the important takeaway that I, I had out of it was that these organizations like the American Alpine Club are using their, you know, their time and energy and resources to fight this issue. And I think that's really key. If a legislator's getting lit up about, you know, taking the cumulative effects analysis out of the NAPA review, you know, I'm sure they're like, I'm getting lit up by the American Alpine Club. Like, what are the, you know, why? We, what do these people care, you know, but they do. And so I think that's huge, you know, you got to get them from all sides. And so these organizations like this that, that have kind of an adjacent connection to climate, but aren't necessarily climate activists. I think that's key that that we get everybody involved. Yeah, and it and it it greatly expands the numbers, right? If yeah. you're, you know, if all of a sudden you have outdoor organizations or public health organizations, you know, all of these institutions that have, you know, part of their mission is impacted by climate getting involved, that starts to give us the critical mass that we need to make change on the timeline that we need to, you know. So, and honestly, you know, to your point too, Todd, it, it probably catches some of these legislators off guard that they're yeah. all of a sudden now I'm not hearing, I expect to hear climate from the environmental NGO, right? But if I'm hearing about climate from, you know, an organization focused on public health or focused on the out of doors, it starts to help connect these dots for people that this is a, you know, problem that cuts across all pieces of society. So with that, the question becomes, as always, you know, what can, can we do? And you know, for this week, given the topic, we want to ask folks, you know, if they donate or, you know, volunteer with an organization whose work is, you know, directly or indirectly impacted by climate change to ask that organization what they're doing to address it. And, and if they're not already out and, and taking action, consider sharing this podcast with them as an opportunity to kind of, you know, provide a different perspective on, on why they should be. And then secondly, you know, take time to tell your personal stories about, you know, climate impacts in the outdoors. It may seem like a small thing, but public opinion really shifts when you start to have, you know, people putting forth a different narrative and, and sharing their personal stories. And, you know, we didn't get to a majority of Americans being concerned about climate change from people not saying anything. It, it really comes from that person to person dialogue. So don't underestimate the power of story. Get out there. And, and make sure you're sharing yours. And as a third option, get out there and get your hands dirty. A lot of these uh, organizations in wilderness areas have already suffered a lot of impact from climate change, be it from wildfires or heavy rainfalls that have caused trail damage. And getting out there and helping them as a volunteer is a, a great way to meet like-minded people and to you know make a difference, get these trails back up and operational again so people can get out there and experience nature and realize that it's worth protecting. Indeed. Well, that's it for this week's episode. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. Come back on January 31st when we'll be talking with an exciting guest from Project Drawdown about you know what our 2023 climate priorities should be given the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act this last year. Climate Optimus is made possible by Climate Stewards Collective. You can find us on the web at climateoptimus.co. And don't forget to follow us on social at Climate Optimus Podcast.